Well, on your screen, there's a picture of three people, uh, Albert Einstein, Oprah Winfrey, and Dr. Seuss. I'm wondering, do you guys know, what do these three people have in common? All three of these people have had failure in their life before they've had success. Uh, Albert Einstein, uh, when he was younger, at 16, he failed an exam going into school. Uh, he began a job as an insurance salesman and was fired from that job. In fact, all through his life, his father considered him to be a failure. But we know the rest of his story, how he is a world-renowned physicist, and without him, we wouldn't have discovered the theory of relativity and all the progresses that science has made. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is well known as a, a TV icon. She has her own network. She is worth billions of dollars, but she was born in extreme poverty. Uh, as a child, she was raised by a single mother and was abused uh, emotionally, physically, and even sexually as a child. When she was 13 years old, she ran away from her home and at 14 was pregnant with a child. That child soon died after birth. Uh, Oprah tried to get into television and her first job in television was a failure and she got fired and was told she didn't have any promise in the TV industry. Uh, Dr. Seuss, um, we know him for his beloved children's books. Uh, when he was, he tried to get a higher education degree and he failed. And so he had to drop out of school. And then his first draft of his first children's book, he went and had it sent to publishers 28 different times and 28 different times he was rejected. Um, all these people had great failure, but now had great success. What was the secret to their success? I'm sure each one would tell you a different story. Well, this morning, I want to, all, to encourage all of us to succeed in our faith, to do well in our faith journey following after God. I want us to be a church that has a great faith and hope in God. But as we know, in our journey of faith, we're going to have many ups and downs. Um, with our successes also come failures. Uh, with our faith also can come fear. And with following God also, we can fall from him. But no matter how much we fall, we know as Edna saying, God's grace is greater than our sin. God's grace is greater than all of our failures. So last week we talked about the life of Abram. And if you would turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, last week we looked at the life of Abraham and discovered what faith was in the life of Abraham. Faith was Abraham uh, preparing today for what was coming tomorrow. He lived a life of obedience in preparation for the hope that God was going to bring him. And we saw last week that God called Abram out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. And God spoke and gave Abram this command, Abram, I want you to go from this land. I want you to leave this land, leave your family, leave your father's home and go to a place I have promised to you. And listen, Abram, as you're going, I'm going to promise you these six things. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to make your name great. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. God, Abram, everywhere you go, I will be with you. And so we see Abram stepping out in faith, leaving what was familiar to what God had promised to him. But as we see here in Genesis chapter 12, Abram's faith falters. Uh, Abram, immediately after trusting God, falls away into a gross and devious sin. So let's look and see what Abram did in Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. And the hope we'll see today is that even when we fail, God is faithful. And even when we sin, God gives us his grace. Notice what happens to Abram in Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. 
for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So say you are my sister, that it may may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. So we see right in the way, right away in the story of Abram that Abram experiences a trial, a test. Abram on his journey goes to the promised land and to a place called the Negev, the desert region. We showed the picture of that place last week, a deserted, secluded place. And it says that even while Abram was living in this deserted place, God sent a famine on the land. There was a famine. So even Abram, in a place of desolation, experienced even greater hardship. So what did Abram do? Um, Instead of trusting God's promise that he would bless him, that he would take care of him, Abram fled. He was afraid and he ran away. So there's four things that Abram did that were wrong that showed that his faith faltered. The first thing that he did was he disobeyed God's promise. He disobeyed God's command uh, to go to the land. God never told Abram to go to Egypt. Also, we see that Abram doubted God's promise. Abram didn't think that God would provide and protect him in the desert region, so he made his own plans on how to save his own skin. And then we see, I think, one of the worst things of all is Abram lied. When he got to Egypt, he was afraid that he would be destroyed, that he would be killed because of his wife, Sarai. So he comes up with this scheme. When we go into Egypt, Sarai, don't say that you're my husband because they're going to kill me and take you. Oh, don't say that you're my wife. You know what I mean. (laughs) Don't say those things because I will die. So Abram, in order to save his own skin, tells a lie. Uh, and deceives the people of Egypt. Uh, And then we see that Abram really here is being selfish, isn't he? Because he is putting himself and his own welfare above and beyond his own wife, above and beyond her care and her safety. He isn't trusting God in his provision. He's only thinking about saving himself. And when I think of what Abram did here, it makes my heart sick. Uh, It it grieves me that someone would do something like this to their family member. So notice what God did next. Look at verse 14. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So what happened to Abram? He prospered. He didn't do so bad. Because of his lie, because of his deception, uh, Pharaoh gave him a dowry. Uh, gave him lots of wealth, lots of possessions, lots of great things. And here's a key that we can learn. Sometimes when we step out of God's will, when we disobey him, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to experience negative consequences right away. For Abram, he was blessed financially. And for some of us, we, you can go and cheat on your taxes. You can cheat on your time card. And, and you can embezzle from the company and think with all the wealth that you're doing okay. And for Abram, with his deception and his lie, he thought, hey, I'm not doing so bad with this deception thing. But what about his wife? There were consequences to Abram's sin. Sarai suffered as a result of Abram and was taken into Pharaoh's palace. Uh, You see, when we sin, there are always consequences. There is always casualty. And and so often in relationships, one person in the relationship can be selfish, and they can think that they're doing really well because they're taking care of themselves while the other person suffers, often in silence. 
So we see here that Abram has a failure. He has a sin. And what I think is amazing about this story is if the story stopped here, this could be the end of Abram's faith journey. Because think about it, Abram could have been here in Egypt. He had everything that he needed. He had his wealth, he had his prosperity, people respected him in the community, and he could have just taken it back and been at ease and missed God's promise and missed the future that God had for him. But notice what happens next. God steps into the story, and God acts on Abram's behalf. Notice what God does in verses 17 through verse 20. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she was my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Abram neglected his wife, but God didn't. God cared for Sarai, and God stepped in to deliver her, and to rescue her. And we know this in life, even if other people do not fill, fulfill their responsibilities, even if those in your past have done you wrong, know this, that God cares about you. God loves you, and he sees what you're going through. And notice that God intervenes. He, he steps into the story, and he causes a, a catastrophe on the people of Egypt. Uh, he causes plagues to come down on them. Well, why does God do this? I think in a way to wake the people, of Pharaoh, the people of Egypt up. When they noticed that they were experiencing sickness and disease, they said, something is wrong. Something is not right here. And so, in investigation, they realize this is because of the guy Abram. This is because he has lied and deceived us. And so, the people of Egypt, the pressure of the condemnation of God came upon them, and they realized we have to, to do something. And so, Pharaoh moved Abram out, said, we, can't, we don't want you here anymore, Abram. We don't want you to stay here. And so, Abram left and he left with all of that blessing. So what gives Abram success? Was it because of what he did? No, it was because of God's grace. Because we see in this story that God steps in and God intervenes for Abram, for Sarai, because of his love, because he wants to keep his promise to Abram. What gave Abram success? It was grace. God's amazing grace. Grace overcame the lies and the deception of Abram. Uh, grace, God's grace, secured God's promise. God was still going to bless Abram. God was still going to get him to the promised land. God was still going to give him descendants and through Abram bring a Messiah. So Abram's failure, Abram's sin could not stop God's promise that was coming. So God intervenes, and God enables Abram to continue his faith journey. So at this point in the story, does Abram wake up? Does he have that epiphany moment of, oh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe this was a wrong thing to do. Well, unfortunately, as we see in the story of Abram, this sin becomes a habit in his life. And we're going to fast forward his story for another 20 years. So go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 20. Uh, we see in Abram's story, even though Abram had faith, he trusted God, he also had great failure. And so in the story of Abraham, in the next 20 years, a lot of things happen in his story. Uh, Abram and his nephew Lot depart in separate ways. Lot goes to a beautiful place, and Abram stays in the desert. Uh, we see that Abram goes into a battle against five armies, a warfare where he comes out victorious. So he has great faith and success as he fights that battle. Uh, then we see Abram falter again by um, having a son with a woman that is not his wife, and that son's name is Ishmael. And so we come to Genesis chapter 20, and we see the story of Abram having faith, but also having great failure. So here we have the same song, second verse. 
Here's Genesis chapter 20. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So there's a picture on your screen of a map of, of Israel and give you a location of this is Gerar. It's in the, the desert region, but Gerar is kind of in a fertile valley that's there in Israel. So there was some um, hope of prosperity there. But we see here again Abram doing the same evil, wicked thing. Um, he's afraid. He's scared. And instead of trusting God in his promise, he lies and is deceptive again. And we see that this sin has become a habit in his life. And just like so many of us, the small sins that we have can continue to grow and become a habit in our life. And we see that Abram takes the sin, it's, it's a habit in his life, and we see him taking the sin of deception and lying and passing it on to his children. Uh, if you read in Genesis chapter 26, his son Isaac does the exact same thing that his father does. Uh, and we look another generation later to his son Jacob, and Jacob's name means the deceiver. And Jacob's story is known of time and time again, deceiving and betraying other people over and over again. So what started for Abram thinking is just a small thing has grown into a great, horrible sin. So does God stop with Abram and say, enough? No, look what God does again in the life of Abram. Please look at Genesis 20, verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife. For he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. What does God do again? He intervenes. And this time he goes to Abimelech in a dream and warns him and says, Abimelech, stop! Don't do what you think you were going to do because it would be wrong. And if you do that, you are a dead man. Because I made a promise to Abram, I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And if you take Sarah, you will be cursed. And so God, in his grace, rescues Abimelech. And God, in his grace, rescues Sarah again. God steps in, and he delivers both Sarai and Abimelech. Why? Because God knows, God sees what's going on in Sarai's life. He cares about her, and God sees what's going on in Abimelech. And even though Abimelech is, is a pagan king, a pagan ruler, God loves him and steps in to save his life. So notice what Abimelech does next. Look at verse 8 of Genesis 20. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me in my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me these things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see? that you did this thing. So Abimelech, this pagan king, shows himself to be more righteous than Abram. It shows him to be a person of more integrity than God's chosen. 
uh, Abimelech steps up and it says immediately. So Abimelech doesn't sit on this dilemma. He stands up and he acts right away. He gets up in the morning and says, something's got to be done and it's got to be done now. And what I like about Abimelech is he goes uh, to Abram and he confronts him. Uh, remember Pharaoh, Pharaoh didn't confront. Pharaoh just said, get out of here, Abram. But Abimelech goes to Abram and says, we got to deal with this sin. We got to deal with this mess that you've created, Abram. So Abram goes up and he confronts this sin. And, and notice, uh, just as, by the way, in our life, sin must always be confronted. And finally, in God's grace, this moment comes in Abram's life where he's being faced with the reality of what he's done. And Abimelech says, look what you've done to my house. Look what you've done to me. Can't you see the, the injury and the harm that you're causing because of your deceit, because of your sin? God in his grace confronts us. And I'm so thankful for that. And I like this question at the end of verse 10. Abram, what did you see? In other words, Abram, what in the world were you thinking? Uh, how in the world could you carry on with this deception? And so Abram has an answer. He has a reason for his deception. Abram has rationalized his sin. So notice what Abram tells Abimelech in verse 11. Abraham said, I did this. Because I thought, there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do me at every place which we come. Say of me, he is my brother. So... Abram rationalizes his sin, and he gives these three excuses. His first excuse is, listen, I'm in a land of pagans. You guys are wicked, horrible people. I can't trust you horrible, wicked people, because you're so bad. What's, what's the bad thing if I just do something wrong? Because you guys are really wicked. You guys are really evil. And the second thing that he does to rationalize his sin is he says, um, what I said was kind of true. Uh, it was sort of right. Because she is my half-sister. And then he also makes this rationalization by saying, listen, this is pragmatic. This has been working for me everywhere I go. And this sickens me because it says for the, for the 20 years that Abram has been journeying, um, for, the, for the last 20, 25 years, he's been saying the same story over and over to every single person he's met. This is not my wife. This is my sister. And there's been only two times that we know of that Abram got caught in his lie. The first with Pharaoh, and now with Abimelech. And you see, sometimes in our life, we can go with the same habitual sin in our lives and rationalize it and cover it up, not knowing the harm and the hurt that it causes. So the reality of Abraham's sin is Abraham was really afraid. Instead of trusting God and his promises to provide for him, Abraham took matters into his own hands. Instead of caring about his wife and her care and her security, he cared more about himself. And one of the worst things that Abraham does is he misrepresents God. Uh, he, he goes to Pharaoh, or he goes here to Abimelech, and he says, oh yeah, I follow God, but I don't really trust him. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe God is true, but I have to come up with lies because I don't think that God will take care of me unless I am deceptive, unless I mistell the truth. What, what kind of an example was he giving to this king? He was supposed to represent God, and instead of glorifying God in his sin, he misrepresented him. And Abram has this habitual lie, this hidden sin in his life. Listen, let's, I just want to pause right here just to warn all of us, to give us a warning. Uh, all of us in our life may have sinful things that we don't know about. Or, or maybe there are sinful things in our life that we know about that we're just kind of pushing off to the side. Uh, we, we, we think we've, we've gotten away with it for so long, does it really matter? Or we've come up with ways to justify the hurtful and the wrong things that we've done. All of us are prone to hidden sins. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things. 
and desperately sick. Who can understand it? This is my heart. That, that is your heart. Uh, our heart is deceitful, and we try to cover up our sin in so many ways. And Psalm 19, 12 says, Who can even know their sins and their errors? Who can declare me innocent from my hidden faults? You see, we have these hidden sins, and we can rationalize them. But notice what God does. Because this is not the end of the story. Even when we rationalize our sin, that's not the end. Notice what God does with Abram in verses 14 through 18. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. So to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given you, your brother, a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of the innocence of you and all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they poured children. Because the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. We see here in the story that Abimelech has greater integrity than Abraham. Uh, Abimelech wants to make things right. Uh, he, he doesn't want sin to take a hold of his life or be part of his home and his family. So he makes sin right by giving Sarai a gift of a thousand pieces of silver and declares to everyone she is innocent. Sarai has done nothing wrong here. She's innocent in all of these matters. And Abimelech um, cares for her and makes her right more than her own husband. But I like what happens next because God tells Abram something. He says, Abram, I want you to pray for Abimelech. Abram, I, I want you to step out here in faith. I, I, want you to show, I want to show you, Abram, that even though you've acted a fool, even though that you failed, I still want to use you. I still want you to be a ministry to others. So Abram prays for Abimelech for him to be healed. Why? Because God made the promise, I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. And because the Egyptian had, because of Abraham's sin, were in a place of cursing, um, God intervened so that they would be healed, so that they would be restored. So, listen closely. What was the key to Abram's success in life? Even though he failed miserably time and time again, why do we call him a man of great faith? It's because of God's grace. As Edna saying, grace is greater than all our sin. Amen. Yeah, can I get another amen? Is that true? Do you believe that today? Amen. God's grace is greater. So in God's grace, God affirmed Abram. He didn't cast him down. He lifted him up. And God continued to bless Abram and his life. And God restored Abram in his relationship with his wife, with his family, and in his relationship with God. Listen, I want to tell you this morning that God's grace is greater than all of your sin. And know this, God is never, ever going to give up on you. God is never going to quit on you. Even if you've quit on God, he's not going to quit on you. Maybe there's someone here today who's had enough of God. Maybe there's someone here who says, you know, I used to, to follow him, but I, I don't want to follow him out. He's caused me too much hurt, too much pain. There's so much trial and hurt in my life. I don't want to go to him anymore. I just feel so much anger and hurt. If that's you this morning, know that God's not going to quit on you. Even if you turn your back on him, he's going to pursue you because he loves you, because he is faithful in his love and his grace. Maybe there's someone here today who's, who knows God is real, who loves God, but in some ways has stopped following God. Uh, maybe there's someone here who, who has stopped obeying one of God's commands. You've, you've found that living in sin is more desirable to you than following after God's commands. And maybe in your life you are living with this overwhelming guilt and despair because of what you've done or what you are doing. If that's you this morning, I want to encourage you and remind you that God is not, has not quit on you. God's grace is relentless, and he is going to pursue you. 
You know, maybe there's someone here today who's given up on the church. Because as you look at the people in the church, you see a lot of broken people. As you look at the people in the church, you see people like Abram. And you look at what Abram did, and he said, how disgusting. How could any man care for his wife and do something like that? And maybe you think of church leaders or, or people in the church community have done horrible things. And you think, how could anybody do that? But know this that God's grace is greater than our sin and that God loves his people and that God does not quit on his church or on his family. Maybe there's someone here today who's given up on themselves. Uh, you, you've looked at your own life and you've looked at your failures and you just say, I, I can't trust God. I can't even trust myself. I, I have no hope for the future. If that's you today, know this, that God is greater than your sin and that God will not quit on you. Why? Because of God's promise, because of his love. 2 Timothy 2.13 says this, If we are faithless, God remains faithful. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. God is always going to keep his promise. God is always going to keep his word. And God is going to pursue you relentlessly with his grace. Why? Because God keeps his promises. God is full of love and compassion and mercy and grace. And God cares more about your faith than you do. Let me say that again. God cares more about your faith than you do. God's grace is relentless. God persists. God perseveres. God protects. God confronts. God gives his grace time and time again. God's grace is greater than all our sin. So why is this true? Look at Ephesians 2 verse 8, which says this. It's by grace that we have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What saves us? It's not our works. It's not our efforts. It's God's amazing grace. God's relentless grace. So some of us look at our lives and we look at others and we say, uh, how can someone do that? Where is God's justice? Uh, where, where, is, where is the sense of right? How could God let Abram get away with something like that? And how can God let sin go on in this world? Well, the answer was resolved at the cross. Because at the cross of Christ, God took all of the punishment, all of the sin, all of the condemnation upon himself. Because of Abram's sin, the people of Egypt suffered. Because of Abram's sin, the people of Gerar were going to suffer. And because of our sin, there was suffering. And that suffering happened on the cross. At the cross, all of our sin and all of our guilt was put on him so that his love and his grace could be poured out upon us. Do you believe in God's grace? Have you put your faith and trust in what Christ did for you? He loves you. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He died for you so that you can have life, uh, so that you don't have to live in the misery of deceit and lies any longer so that you can live a life of wholeness and peace and joy. God loves you so much. He gave you his grace. Receive his grace today. Don't walk away in your sin. Don't live any longer in the deception and the lies. Receive his grace and his mercy. He loves you, and he's not going to quit on you. Take his grace in your arms today. So what do we do? How do we live with this grace truth? We live in simple obedience and simple trust. We just simply trust and obey what God has given to us. Paul made this promise in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work, what's he going to do? He's going to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. There's the promise. Do you trust that promise? Do you believe that's true? And because that's true, notice what, God's, notice what Paul says, what God says in Philippians 2, verse 13. Because it's true that God's not going to quit on you, work out your salvation 
Keep obeying God and his word. Keep following after him and do that with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work within you. Because God's going to keep pouring out his grace to help you. So the great truth of Abraham is, yes, Abraham failed. He failed miserably. But God gives grace. And the great truth is grace wins every time. There's a song by Matthew West that says those words, grace wins. I want to close with these words that he wrote. There's a war between guilt and grace. And they're fighting for a sacred space. But I'm living proof Grace wins every time. No more lying down in death's defeat. I'm rising up now in victory. I'm singing hallelujah because grace wins every time. For the prodigal son, grace wins. For the woman at the well, grace wins. For the blind man and the beggar, grace wins. For always and forever, grace wins. For the lost on the street, grace wins. For the part of you and me that's lost, grace wins. For the thief on the cross, grace wins. And for a world that is lost, grace wins. Grace wins every time.